Later this afternoon in Barbados, our old friend and colleague Tony Cozier will be laid to rest. Tony's broadcasting career on both radio and television spanned 50 years. His last commentary was on Test Match Special last year when England toured the West Indies. Tony was the son of a journalist, a keen club cricketer, a man who enjoyed life to the full when the sun went down and whose distinctive Bayesian accent made his cricket commentary sing. Here comes Garner on the way now to Broad and Broad edges. He's out caught. A third slip by Harper. Now, is Marshall going to come out? Well, they're waiting. Yes, he looks as if he is going to come out. In fact, everybody was walking off. He's out caught and bowled by holding. The bowler had no business getting across there to take that catch, and yet somehow he managed to. I like any sort of cricket. I can go on the beach and watch fellas play. Once you're male and you're, you're from Barbados uh, and you're of my vintage, um, you are expected uh, to love the game with a passion, and I think that you'll find that. Here is uh, Sawan, goes back and chops it into his stumps, he's bowled. Well, the pressure is told. And England get another wicket. The West Indies, 235 now for four. Alan McGilvery taught me a lot about uh, the technique of commentary. Uh, he came here in 1965 with Australia, and that was my first time doing commentary on an entire series. Um, so he taught me all sorts of techniques about commentary. And that's in the air, it's over the top, and uh, let's see if it'll hit in the turf and go all the way. Yes, it does. The boycott lifting it over the top, perhaps he didn't get hold of it quite as well as he wanted, but that was enough. I'll give you one uh, example where a bowler is running up, and you hear a number of commentators will say he's, he's on his way and, he's, and he bowls. Yes. McGillivray said, why do you say he's bowling? Why, why he bowls? Because that's what he's going to do, and you're wasting that fraction of a second where you say he bowls and it's with the batsman already so just say he's on his way and then transfer your attention to the batsman here's Paul into Cook and Cook is hammering it down he's out caught at backward point a low catch well taken by Smith cut away inches from the ground Smith went down and took it as casual and as easy as you like and here is uh, Cook now to Dujon, who sweeps down towards deep backward square. This could be a century. That's it. Four runs. Jeffrey Dujon has got a century. His first against England, his first in England. Raises the bat above his shoulder. Is congratulated by Gordon Greenwich. Mascarenas on the way again to Samuels. And Samuels hits it high in the air. This is going to go back, 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 back. Six. <laughs> Lucky that airliner which is coming in now wasn't uh, in the path when that ball went up. For listening, as I did when I was at school, you couldn't beat John Arlott. I mean, everyone at school wanted to do John Arlott. Um, but Brian Johnston made Test Match Special with his personality. It came through his personality, came through on Test Match Special. Richards is wrapped in the pad, there's an appeal, he's out leg before. Richards out leg before wicket, Agnew strikes, he's got his second wicket, and what wickets? Greenwich first, and now Richards leg before, shuffling across his stumps, the West Indies are 69 for three. Botham drives into the gully, brilliantly caught by Garner, magnificent catch by Garner. Marshall troops back to his mark at that far end, this angled approach, few little stuttering steps before breaking into his quick run-up to Willis, and Willis is bowled, that's the end of the innings. England all out for 286. Willis bowl by Marshall for two. Last ball of the over. 136 for four. West Indies 56 needed now. As Bravo waits now and is right in behind it. Anderson around the wicket. End of the over. I think that will be my last stint in the on the day and probably for the match. And thank you. Cheers. And yes, those were Tony's last words at a cricket match, the last test he covered. It was last year as the West Indies completed their victory over England in Barbados. Well, later we're going to hear from Michael Holding, a man who knew Tony as well as anyone, and his friends here in the TMS box will share their memories. But first, the man whose job it was to be Tony's producer for many of those 50 years, Peter Baxter. I asked him if he remembered their first meeting. Funnily enough, I don't actually remember. It must have been late 60s, I suppose. Um, he did... He worked his first test match on TMS, was the test match before I first went into the test match special box uh, in 1966. He may have been there at the Oval on that occasion, but Roy Lawrence uh, was back in the chair for the West Indies. 
Um, and I sort of became aware uh, of, of Tony being around, but I'd, I'd certainly heard his voice before I met the man. Yeah, but are you saying that actually is an illustration of just how, just how long, how many years Tony was doing this for? Yes, thanks. <laughs> yes, I mean, he was over fifty years in the in the saddle. It's amazing, isn't it? It is. It is absolutely extraordinary. In fact, he'd done. He'd made his debut the year before in the West Indies, uh, when, of course, Jonas set him up magnificently in Trinidad with, the, with one of his Jonas's favourite old and oldest gags, where he uh, was uh, doing something. He saw Tony returning to the box when they weren't on the air, but he pretended they were asked him a difficult question about statistics and ages of the West Indies players and all the rest of it and tried to push him along and Tony floundered along before uh, John has revealed to him that they weren't on the air at all. It was very, it was very cruel. <laughs> you, you've, you've worked with so many commentators uh, through the years. Uh, I wonder what it was that made Tony special as far as you were concerned. He was, he was very detailed, he was very accurate, but with a nice light touch. He was quite serious about his work, wasn't he? I mean, he was yes. a good party animal away from his work but but when he was working absolutely and he knew everything absolutely everything he'd read everything he'd heard any number of programs that were on at the same time i don't know how he did it but he was so well informed about everything and so you could ask him any question certainly about any west indian player he'd know all about his background. Yes. For someone, as you said, who, who did enjoy life to the full, he, yes. he, he, was, he was also a traditionalist oh, as far as so. dress codes were concerned, but also mm. the discipline of commentary, I always felt. And I remember him talking to me when I first met him uh, in, in 1991 for my first game with him, talking about actually the basic nuts and bolts of commentary. You know, yes. in come, the bowler comes in, you must say the batsman's name, he plays it out to mid-off, whatever it is. And then that would... You know, it, it is obviously the the recognised way of doing it, but Tony was a real stickler for doing that. And right up to the moment, so he was with the bowler as he bowled. There yes. was no no report. He would never uh, dreamt of talking through a ball or anything like that. He was absolutely right up to it with perfect description. And, you know, he'd been a decent enough cricketer himself to know what he was talking about too. Yes. What I loved about him too was the, the sound of real joy in his voice, whether it was just the Bayesian accent. <laughs> But it had it almost sang, didn't it? And, and obviously, when West Indies were going well, nineteen uh, seventies and nineteen eighties, you'll recall those tours, I'm sure. I mean, Indeed. he was more than singing. I mean, he 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 really he really did enjoy West Indies' performance then. It, it was the, yes, the sort of Barbadian lilt it's been called, but that yeah. really is is the word for it. It, it was a, it's a very pleasant uh, accent on the ear. Until, of course, he's talking to another Barbadian. <laughs> I mean, just talking to his wife or talking to Donna Simmons or something like that. And he became totally incomprehensible yes. because the Bajan, <laughs> I think, probably is the strongest of all the patois in the West Indies. What I also really admired about Tony, and, and you'd have experienced this as well, and in fact, a close hand, really, was that tightrope that he had to walk uh, in, in the Caribbean as far as his job was concerned. I mean, the merest criticism... Of, of any other country's cricketer other than Barbados, and he would just have everything thrown at him, wouldn't he? I remember uh, a match in, in Trinidad when he'd been mildly critical of Phil Simmons as a test cricketer, uh, who, of course, promptly came out and scored a half century, but in a one-day international, which was the point, actually, that Tony was trying to make. But I remember Queen's Park just, uh, just re reverberated the shouts of Cozier. Cozier, and he was under the table in the press box. I mean, you know, literally, it was it was that sort of awful atmosphere, and and yet he always sort of carried on very stoically, didn't he? He he was sort of accepted and recognised the situation. Yes, I certainly remember that that occasion of of the um, of the Phil Simmons business. Yes. But uh, as you say, uh, at every stage, it, it's extraordinary, and people forget sometimes in this country that that you know the West Indies is a lot of of sovereign countries uh, making up the thing, which is what makes their life so difficult. Which means that the great captains have been the ones who managed to get them to play together. I mean, you think of Frank Worrell amongst the first who got them all to play as as a unit. Um, but the Frank Worrell is not uh, was not certainly before his death widely admired in Barbados because he'd uh, he hadn't always favoured Barbadian players and, yes. and uh, you know, he, well you were, I think you were there for the no comings no goings Absolutely. test match and yes. that's what happens and Tony actually negotiated it remarkably well all that stuff yes and I, you, there was an incident wasn't there involving um, Chris Martin Jenkins. 
uh, and and the Barbadian umpire, of course. Yes, uh, Lloyd Barker, yes. who'd, who'd given uh, Rob Bailey out, uh, caught off his hip down the leg side and then been charged uh, by, uh, well, Viv actually charged at him. And he, after handing the bowler his cap, he rather changed his decision. And um, CMJ did a piece actually very carefully worded, but of course, um, it, it, by the time it came back to Barbados, it was seen as accusing a Barbadian umpire of cheating. And, and suddenly, the storm that blew up, we were sharing commentary on that tour with Voice of Barbados. And we couldn't after that after that match. We had to uh, do our own thing. It was they Hastings Ridge. You on. No, for the last two days of the test match, we had to do our own commentary. And I obviously approached all the um, people we'd been working with. And um, of the Barbadians, only Tony would do it. Yes. Um, the fun side of Tony, uh, <laughs> w- w- of which there was a huge one. I know where you're, th- you're thinking of Concert Bay, aren't you? And, I am. And, uh, That's exactly where I'm going. I, I mean, when I, we I, could I, find it. It's <laughs> easier to find it now talking about it than ever to, to find his sort of beach house, which oh. was on the on, on, on Concert Bay on the east side of, uh, of Barbados. And all, everyone would strike off in mini mokes and cars on the rest day of a test match, uh, f- full of optimism that you'd find this place. <laughs> it took hours of thrashing through the cane fields. But when you did get there... There was this lovely rustic, well, sort of large shed it perched was, on, the, on the rocks overlooking the Atlantic with the waves rolling in and Tony in his shorts and a T-shirt and, and, and a rum. And of Banks beer yeah. and flying fish butties. And Absolutely. Yes, wonderful, and Calypso it? music. Yeah, that cricket was, on the beach. That was Tony. Yeah, it was. He loved it. He used to go there yeah, on more than one occasion. He went, went there to sort of finish writing a book. And how he did it with with the distraction of looking at the view, I don't yeah. know. But but he he could concentrate pretty hard when he needed to, couldn't he? Yeah, I've got I've got to remember of him dancing on my on our terrace table outside to Eclipse and music late one night. But that's a, that's another story. <laughs> Where he did feature, although entirely anonymously, of course, uh, but played a very important part. As, as he as he was would always say and has written his finest commentary in all those years of fifty years of commentating. His best piece of radio commentary was actually not saying anything at the Oval in 1991. <laughs> yes. I'm talking about the leg over, uh, which, of course, primarily featured um, dear old Jonathan B and the odd snort from Bill Frindle. However, to my left, Tony sat absolutely silently, but with a microphone in front of him. He could have talked at any moment. He could. He was sitting and writing his, his reports up for the nation, and uh, he didn't... Uh, yes, he wasn't going to get... I, I did ask him um, after. I said, you could have bailed us out then. He said, oh, no, man. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, actually, in a way, uh, that, that sums him up, because he did... Uh, he, he always refused. You remember when it rained? He was always the first one out of the box. I'm not yes. getting involved, man. You try and get him back. No, no. Uh, he wasn't going to do that. Except I do remember once, many, many years ago, in a rain interval, when he uh, he challenged this business of everyone thinking the West Indies is all the same. And he, he was red hot on the politics of the Caribbean and the history of the politics of the Caribbean. So he did a bit of that. And he demonstrated the different accents of the different islands, hitting it absolutely spot yeah. on, all of them. And it was a brilliant piece. He just went round all all the different accents of the islands. For me, you know, he, he must be the most complete cricket reporter stroke commentator mm. stroke journalist because he he did everything didn't he and but he everything at that level yeah. television you know we're both radio people um but he he, he commentated on tv ball by ball i'm not talking about the you know the, the stuff with just the color stuff but proper ball by ball commentary for half an hour and they would walk straight through onto the radio box and do exactly the same but in an entirely different way of course yeah. because they're such different disciplines and yeah you know, i admire him enormously for that Yes, I mean, there, there often, as you say, no gap at all. And, and I suppose people should understand that the television um, commentary is more akin to the expert summariser on radio than it is to the ball-by-ball commentator on radio. They're totally different jobs. And um, he could just switch uh, and seamlessly. You'd never notice. You wouldn't even give thought to the fact that he'd, he'd made that transition.